Thanks for the introduction. So good morning, everyone. My name is Guan Nan, and I'm also from Purdue University. Today I'm going to talk about our paper on staged abstract interpreter. And this is a joint work with Yu Xuan and my advisor, Tiark. So when we build a, a tool for a program language, semantics is also the tool we use to, to describe the behavior and reason about the correctness. And in terms of static analysis, abstract interpretation provides a theoretical foundation to approximate solutions of undecidable problems. And so that we can design sound static analysis from a concrete semantics by applying several steps of abstractions. And more recently, using the abstracting abstract machine approach and the abstracting definition approach, we can directly uh, derive semantic artifacts for abstract, intuition, abstract interpretation from their concrete counterparts. Those concrete parts include small step abstract machines or big step definition interpreters. And those approaches are all good in the sense that they provide a relatively easy way to create useful practical and sound tools from the, from the concrete interpreters. But in general, they are not efficient by design. And if we really care about efficiencies and looking at the concrete interpreters, people usually build compilers. And those compilers generate code that actually does the job we would like to do. And almost uh, at the, the same time when abstract notation was proposed uh, in 1970s, uh, a Japanese computer scientist, Tomura, observed uh, a close relation between compilers and interpreters. We can derive compilers by specializing interpreters. And this derivation or specialization can be mechanized uh, or automated. And uh, one effective way to implement this photomorph projection is to use multi-state programming. So multi-state programming is a kind of programming diagram. And it provides a way to programmers to control which part of the program should be specialized. So that with the help of multi-state programming, we can directly turn an unstaged interpreter into a staged interpreter that is already a compiler. And one of the recent example uh, 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 applying this idea of tomorrow projection and multi set program is that we can turn a SQL query com interpreter into a query compiler uh, in a relatively easy way. And now we have seen those two dimensions. One is the way we can derive some static analysis tools. Another one is we can derive compilers and both from the the, the concrete definition interpreters. And those two, two dimensions can be combined quite smoothly. And then after getting this diagram, it is quite natural to ask, uh, what if we combine those two ideas by abstraction and uh, uh, specialization? Can we obtain some abstract interpreter that is both efficient and corrected by constructor? But yet, the, 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 the abstract interpreter is still quite different from the concrete interpreters. For example, the abstract interpreter operates on abstract values and also it's constantly perform join operation to compute the least upper bound. And uh, when, when, you ha when the program have conditionals or uh, branches, the abstract interpreter usually needs to perform both branches non-determinously to have a sound result. And also to ensure the termination, abstract interpreter usually needs to perform a fixed point uh, iteration to, to iterate go over the program. And in this paper, we, we do so and show all of them are not problems. And we can indeed have this staged abstract interpreter. And next, I'm going to tell you more details. So uh, in summary, we, we can construct uh, the first Futomora projection of abstract interpreters. So in other words, we can specialize an abstract interpreter to an input program within a multi-staging framework. So in terms of static analysis, we consider a, a small higher order functional language as a target language. It's basically lambda calculus extended with uh, data types, recursions, and conditionals. And the baseline we consider here is a monadic big step abstracting definition interpreters, which was shown at ICFP in 2017. And we implement our staged abstract interpreter in Scala and using the lightweight modeling staging framework. And the result here is we can generate, by, by specializing the abstract interpreter, we can generate low-level code, and there is no monads and no interpretation overhead in the, in the generated code. So how can we do this? So the approach, the core idea here we use is to build a very generic definition interpreter that abstracts over both the value domains and the binding times. 
By abstracting over the value domains, we can control whether the interpreter works on concrete domains or abstract domains. And by abstracting over the binding times, we can control whether the interpreter works as a real interpreter or works as a compiler by generating code. And then we can derive those four uh, different dimensions according to those dimensions. And th this derivation is modular and can be done in a relatively easy way. Okay. So next I will introduce the, the basic technique we used, which is uh, multi-step programming. So multi-step programming is a way of doing metaprogramming. And by saying metaprogramming, I mean we can write programs to generate or manipulate other programs. And multi-state programming provides a way to program, to annotate the program, and control which part of the program should be uh, specialized. And uh, multi-state programming al also provides a way to do runtime code generation in a type-safe manner. A classic example to introduce uh, multi-state programming is this power function that takes two number b and x and computes the result of b to the power of x. And here I will also use this example and use uh, lightweight modular staging framework to show the idea. So here we have the, the, the definition of this power function. It takes two number b and x, uh, both natural numbers. And it first looks at whether x is 0. If so, it simply returns 1. Otherwise, it returns b times a recursive call of power function and with a smaller number of x. And it's quite a standard recursive way to write this power function. And now the user may define another auxiliary function called power 5. Now this power 5 only takes a single number b and fixing the, the number x to 5. And then every time uh, other part of the program invokes the, this power 5 function, then it's redirected to the original power function and unroll the, unrolling this original power function uh, recursively for five times. So here is uh, where the overhead comes from. And we can apply multi-state programming to optimize it. So then, because we know that x is known at the current stage and b is known at the later stage. So we change the type of b from the natural number n, from natural number to rep n, meaning that here b is just a representation of a natural number, but we don't know it yet. And uh, in contrast, uh, x is still a, a plan type n, meaning that we know x at the current stage. And accordingly, the, the return type of this power function is also changed to this rep type. And here, the main body of this function can be remain the same, because the, in, in Scala and using the framework, we can overload this multiplication operator uh, by the rep type. So we don't need to change the main program, and we just need to add the type level state annotations. And then the user may write this power function as euro and slightly change the type. Then using the specialization or code generation, we will obtain a next stage function power five looks like this. It's simply just a uh, uh, time speed for five times so that we can uh, optimize away the overhead. So how does it relate to interpreter specialization? Well, now consider we have an Im interpreter that takes an AST of the program, which is the E here, and also takes uh, the environment and store. And this interpreter also returns the value and the store uh, for effects. And because we know the AST E at the current stage, but the environment and the store of this function depends on the, the dynamic execution of the program. So the environment row and the sigma store, we annotate the type with this wrap annotation. And also the return type is also with this annotation. Now, given the program E, we can have a specialized uh, program or specialized interpreter called eval E here. And this eval E only takes two arguments, which is the environment and the store. And then for any, st for any environment and store, this should produce the same result as we uh, apply the interpreter directly as euro. So this is known as the first of the projection and kind of served as a simplification of the interpreter specialization. Okay. Next, I'm going to introduce the idea of generic definition interpreter. So the two ideas here is we need to abstract uh, both the value domain types and also the binding time types. So on the right-hand side, here is kind of the, the skeleton of the, our generic definition interpreter. It is written in Scala and also written in monadic style. So we can see here it takes uh, the program E here, which is basically the AST of the program, and does the path matching over the AST. 
And uh, here I just show three basic cases of the lambda calculus. And for example, here the first case is uh, the variable case. We, we use uh, the for and yield style, which is the, basically the, the monadic style in Scala. We first get the environment and the gas store and returns the results uh, after retrieving the values from the store. And we can write the other part of the program like this. And the first idea, and then we can derive this four different semantic artifacts without changing this generic definition character. So this generic definition character is shared between our four different semantic artifacts. Then the first idea is we need to abstract over the value domain types. So here is just uh, an abstract type value, and we are now defining it, but just to declare here's the type. And then also note that this generic interpreter returns a value of some type answer. And this answer type is, uh, is a monad type, and also an abstract monad type. Uh, this monad type is parameterized over the type value. And of course, because it's a monad, it has to implement uh, some monadic operations. Here I list uh, two of them. The first one, flat map, is basically the monadic binding in Scala. And the second map is basically the, the functor map. And uh, we also need to declare several primitive operations, and there are still abstract methods. For example, the first one is the close function that used to create closure representation for lambda terms. And the second one I listed here is this app, uh, app closure function that used uh, to, to, performing, to perform uh, function applications. Okay. The, this is uh, also quite standard way to use monads to implement abstract interpretation semantics. And the next idea is we need to abstract over binding time types. Here we, we, we introduce a higher kind of type R here, which is takes a type and returns another type. So it's a kind of uh, type constructor. And there are two different ways to instantiate this R type. The first one is we can simply put make it as an identity type function. Then it makes the interpreter, the generic interpreter works as a real interpreter because there's no difference between the current stage and later stage. And another way to instantiate is we can use the, this wrap type provided from the, the LMS framework to, to, to serve as the stage annotation. And also we need to change the monad to be also stage polymorphic. So here we basically insert this R, higher candidate type R into the monad type. And we can use this type R to annotate the data types uh, inside of the monad, which is a type A and type B here. Then accordingly, uh, the primitive operations uh, are also changed to be stage polymorphic. Then after seeing those two ideas, we, we, already, we already see how to stage away the monads. So the key idea is we only stage or add stage annotations over the data manipulated by the monads. We do not stage any monad operation or monads object in Scala. Okay. So here is a key idea. And then we can use these two, two abstractions to, to derive the four different semantic artifacts. So the first one is the unstaged the concrete interpreter. So here the values is just a, a kind of defunctionalized closure representation, just a pair of the syntactic lambda term and environment. And the binding time is just an identity type function. And to, to encode the concrete semantics, we use monad transformers. Here we use a, a reader effects for the environment and the state effects for the store. And this is also a, a classical way to write monadic interpreters. And then for state the concrete interpreters, because now the closure becomes a next stage value. So it's not a, a defunctionalized pair anymore. So here we use a, a next state, next scala function to represent the closures. So it's basically a, a Scala function that takes a value and a store and also returns a value and a store. And also note the type here, we use a wrap type to, to annotate it's, it's a next stage thing. And here we use a two level binding time type. And for the monads, we keep the, the monad stack structure the same as before, but we simply just uh, replace the monad transformer to their corresponding staged version. That is, they operate on staged data. And then for the unstage abstract interpreter, here we have the, the, the values as before, but I use the, the simple power set lattice for the abstract interpretation. So we have a set of row values, 
and the binding time is still the, the simple identity type. And then for the, the, the big step, abstract semantics, here we adopt the abstracting definitional approach and use uh, uh, int further introduce a uh, non-deterministic uh, monad transformer and a catch monad. The non-deterministic transformer is used to, uh, to represent multiple choices when we have branchings or multiple values from the store. And the catch is used to prevent the interpreter running into forever. And then for, finally, we can show the stage abstract interpreter which is quite relatively straightforward and easy. We just need to uh, replace the monad uh, structure to the monad transformer or monads uh, using their corresponding staged version. Okay. Now I have shown all of these four different semantic artifacts. You may be curious about what does a generated code may look like. So here we consider a, a scheme function map, which takes a list and a function and apply this function to all the elements in this list and return the transform the list. So this is uh, the, the stage the code after using our stage abstract interpreter. I'm not expecting you can see this, but l maybe let's zoom in a little bit to see what's actually going on there. So here is the beginning of this function. It takes uh, four arguments. The first one is uh, the list of the original arguments of this map function, and also it takes the store and two catches, which are both introduced uh, by the abstract semantics. And then it first computes addresses of the arguments. And then it's, it's using these arguments and their actual values, which is x40 here, it's updated the store using the, the join manner uh, with this fold left and union operations. And the rest of the code follows roughly the same structure. And there are two more things we can observe in this generated code. The first is there's no monadic layer in the generated code. And this compiled analysis is actually a, a Scala function and is modular and can be reused later. Then we, we talked more things in the paper. Uh, the first is we discuss uh, several optimizations to further improve the performance and reduce the size of generated code. And we also have a comparison with abstract compilation. So the common thing here is uh, they both apply the idea of partial evaluation. And but one of the advantage we have is we just need to change the type annotations. And we do now need to refactor the whole analyzer to be this closure generation form. And we also discuss uh, how to integrate with other control for analysis techniques. And the thing here is those analysis are orthogonal to the staging, and they do not need to change the generic definition interpreters. And then let's maybe look at the, the performance evaluation. And we, we implement two variants of zero CFA, uh, control for analysis. One is equipped with store winding and another one without, with, with, without store winding. And the baseline is a unstaged monadic abstract interpreter written in Scala and uses the monad transformers also written in Scala. And our prototype is a staged monadic abstract interpreter written in Scala and also generated Scala. So we can compare the performance under the same runtime. So this table shows the, the running times of unstaged version and the, the, the running time of the generated code. We can observe the basically uh, an order of magnitude faster. The, the, the stage version is an order of magnitude faster than the end stage version. And to conclude my talk, uh, I have presented uh, the how to construct the first photoron projection of abstract interpreter in a smoothly in a smooth framework. And our approach is an abstraction without regret approach to compile and optimize that analysis using multi-state programming and program specialization. And our approach is semantic based and it's written in a, in a high level clear style, which is monadic style, and it achieves efficiency by generating low level code. So this is the end of my talk. Thanks for listening and I'm happy to take questions. Yes. So uh, thank you very much for the nice talk. Uh, so in, in my work, we also have the, a similar setup with uh, such a generic interpreter. And we already get a lot of benefits by simply inlining the monadic operations. So can you explain like, what more do you get from explicitly staging the um, interpreter compared to simply inlining the monadic operations? So, yeah, thanks for the question. 
So one of the, the one more things we can do is we can apply more rewritings uh, during a staging, like partially static data. So you can apply more aggressive optimizations during a staging. Another thing we can do is we can further generate uh, uh, heterogeneous staging code, like we can generate C code that further improve much more performance, I think. Yeah. So thanks for the lovely talk. Uh, so your results are greatly positive, but mm -hmm. they can also be seen as negative for other work. Mm -hmm. uh, and what by, I mean by that is that not many people are going to apply staging to a static analysis mm -hmm. effectively because staging is complex. But are you telling us that if we implement a static analysis literally as an abstract interpreter all the way to the implementation level, we lose an order of magnitude in performance? Well, I would say like you, it may have overhead, just like interpreter, you need to traverse the AST of the program. You, if you're written in purely functional programs, you, know, you may use monads or other uh, encoding of effects. That's all kind of overhead. That doesn't mean the stack analysis itself has loose, loose performance, but there are other things we can animate by staging. Yeah, but if I want yeah. performance, I don't write an interpreter. Are you saying that if I want performance in my analysis, mm -hmm. I shouldn't write literally an abstract interpreter. Maybe I formalize it mm -hmm. as an abstract interpreter, but at the implementation level, I do something a little more tuned to performance? Uh, I think it's a kind of a trade-off. If, if you can implement the static analysis, in, you can formulate the static analysis in abstract interpreter, then you can implement it in a quite easy way. And then you can basically get the performance starting from there. Of course, you can have more better performance by like directly in thinking a, a more aggressive compiler or similar things. Yeah. Maybe to answer that, so I think part of what we show is that, you know, staging is not complex, right? So it's not more complex than, you know, swapping the types for the abstract domains, right? So you should, you should actually implement your static analysis as a high-level interpreter and you can basically get the performance for free. 